My name is Eric Morgan and I'm a software engineer at Mindware Technologies and I'm going to be your presenter today. So the webinar is going to be split into two main parts. We're first going to start with a walkthrough of the ECG editor and then we're going to follow that up with an interactive Q&A session. Some of the topics that we're going to cover during the walkthrough of the ECG editor include an overview on ECG editing, sort of what are we editing, where does the information that we're editing come from, uh, the importance behind editing the ECG series in determining our statistics. We're then going to launch the ECG editor itself, specifically in the HRV application, and we're going to look at the controls that are available to us in there for performing the different types of edits that we need to perform. Then we're going to look at how we save those edits and how we subsequently load them. And finally, I'm going to go over some tips and tricks related to using the editor in a variety of situations. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the steps leading up to editing so we understand where the signal is coming from and where the points are coming from that we're editing. We start with our ECG signal. Now this may be filtered. You may have applied filters to this in the analysis applications or even during biolab. But we have our ECG signal. And we're going to pass that ECG signal through a peak detector, an algorithm that attempts to identify the R peaks for each cycle of ECG. And this is done by searching for characteristics of the signal which match the expected characteristics of an R peak. But this peak detector is not perfect. And it can struggle with non-normal data, which can be caused by motion noise, by poor electrode placement or connection, or by some sort of electrical interference like 60 hertz noise caused by surrounding electrical equipment. And so we want to take these peaks that we're trying to identify and determine whether or not they might be artifact or error introduced by the peak detector. And in the Mindware applications, we have two artifact detection algorithms we use to help us decide whether something might be artifact. We have the IBI min-max, which simply looks at heart rate changes that either go above or below specified thresholds. And we have the MAD MED check, which looks at variability between beats and whether it's physiologically possible or unlikely that a, an IBI can vary by a certain amount beat to beat. And we're going to take these, the peaks and we're going to pass it through these algorithms and determine which ones might be correct and which ones need further examination which leads us to our final step of artifact correction. This is where we're going to use the ECG editor to fix the mistakes of the peak detector, to properly identify all of the visible R peaks in a segment so that we are capturing the most information from a given segment and using it to determine our statistics. So why is editing important? Sometimes we're looking at segments of 120 seconds, 300 seconds worth of data. Does it really matter if the occasional R peak is not marked correctly? Absolutely. It definitely does. <clears throat> and now's a good time to, to mention the difference between editing for heart rate variability and for impedance cardiography. Because in both of these applications, we're using the same ECG editor, and we're still analyzing the same ECG data, but we do it in a slightly different way. And so most of our examples are going to be done in the HRV application, but I'm going to allude to and mention some different ways in which you would analyze or edit segments if you were analyzing in impedance. For heart rate variability, we need this 30-second contiguous window of R peaks to calculate RSA. And if you miss any beats or add any beats to that segment, then it's going to increase or reduce the variability of your segment and therefore affect your RSA measure. With impedance cardiography, we're looking for good cycles of ECG and DZDT to form our ensemble or our average cycle for that segment. And if we have bad cycles marked, then we're going to corrupt that average and therefore affect all of our statistics. As an example, I'm going to use this segment of HRV data in which there are currently no artifacts. All of the R peaks are marked in blue, and, and we have an RSA measure of a reasonable value. Now, if we were to introduce even one artifact into this segment, 
we can see that our RSA value has changed by an entire unit. That is statistically significant when you're analyzing heart rate variability. Now, if you were to introduce many artifacts, you could see that the difference between a clean segment and a segment with many artifacts is truly significant. So it is really important to pay attention to when, when you see artifacts marked that you investigate them and correct them using the ECG editor. Before we get into the application, I'm gonna go over some typical editing scenarios from a high level perspective using some diagrams. And then we'll get into a file where a lot of these are showcased and we'll use the tools available to us to actually perform these edits. One issue that might come up is that we'll see an extra beat that's been flagged. Here it happens to be on a P wave, but it could be on a T wave. It could be just from high amplitude noise in between beats. In any case, when we see an extra beat like this, we want to delete it. Simple as that. When we see a missing beat, but we can tell visually that there is an R peak there, just because we know what an R peak should look like, we want to insert it. And then there's the case where there's a missing beat and you can't quite tell where the R peak should be because the noise has corrupted the signal so much that you can't tell the R peak from the noise. This is where it gets a little tricky and it changes a little bit whether you're doing HRV or impedance analysis. <clears throat> In HRV, because we need that 30 second contiguous section of R peaks, we have to sort of guess where this R peak would be. And we have tools in the ECG editor that allow us to do that. It's called mid-beating. For impedance, since we only want to identify quality cycles of ECG within a given segment, we would just leave it like this. Because by placing a point there, we would actually be corrupting our ensemble. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and launch the HRV application. And we'll start using some of the tools in the ECG editor to perform some of these edits. Okay, so now I've switched over to the HRV application and I'm going to pull up the analysis screen. So we can see here that much like the screens I showed you in the presentation, there are many blue dots marking our peaks and those are the application's way of saying that they are most likely a correct placement of an R peak. And then we have some yellow dots near the end of the segment, which draw our attention to it that this might be an area of problem. Now, we can very clearly see that the data changes here and that we definitely need to address something. But to do so, we need to go into the edit R's screen and investigate a little closer. So I'm going to take my cursor up to the top of the screen and click on the edit R's button to bring up the ECG editor. So this is the ECG editor. This is where you're going to be performing all of your edits on the ECG data. And as we go through several examples, I'll highlight different tools and different areas of the screen that are important. <clears throat> so obviously the focal point here is the plot where we see our ECG waveform and our, in this case, respiration behind it. If you were doing this in impedance, you would see your DZDT waveform behind the ECG in blue. The rest color can actually be changed by clicking on this color box to the right hand side of the screen. And you can change it to something that maybe is a little more easy for you to see. Sometimes that can be distracting, so we keep it as a, a darker color to start. But if you want to see the respiration enhance a little bit, you can change it to whatever color you see fit. Okay, so now in order to examine this area of data more closely, we need to zoom in on it to see exactly what's going on where we see these yellow markers. To do that, I'm going to use the graph tools located at the bottom left corner of the graph, and specifically the zoom tools. So in the middle, you'll see that there's a magnifying glass icon. I'm going to click on that, and you have several zoom options. The middle one on the top is a horizontal zoom which allows you to select an area of time in which to zoom to. And if you have questions about the different types of zooms, there is a support article available on our support site that 
goes over all of them in more detail than this. We'll be using a couple of them today. So I'm going to click on that zoom option and you'll see my cursor changes from the crosshairs to a magnifying glass. And I'm going to left click to the left of the noise area which I want to examine and drag my mouse across while holding the mouse button down to define the area in which I want to zoom. Once I've done that, I'm going to release it and we will now see that area but in much greater detail. And now we can really see what's going on with the waveform at this point in time. And we can see that we have an, an R peak that has a yellow star on it, followed by some noise that doesn't really look like an R peak, it looks just like noise, followed by another R peak with a yellow marker on it. And so this is one of those examples where the peak detector has falsely identified noise as an R peak. The noise being those very high amplitude yellow marked peaks in view. And so what do we want to do? We want to delete these. And we're going to do that by using the, de the delete tool. So I'm going to click on the red delete button. And when I do that, and I move my mouse back into the plot, you'll see that it's changed to an orange circle that's dotted. And this is now depicting the area in which you're looking for peaks to delete. So what I'd want to do is move my cursor so that one of these yellow peaks is included in this orange circle and press my left mouse button to delete it. <clears throat> and I can do the same thing for this other peak that's clearly not on an R peak. And when I do that, you'll see that the R peaks around it have now turned blue because the timing that we expect between peaks has been restored and all beats now pass the artifact detection criterion. This circle can be expanded or contracted by using the mouse wheel. So by pushing the mouse wheel forward, I can increase the diameter of that circle. And by pulling it back, I can decrease it. You'll also notice that there's a sensitivity meter in the upper left-hand corner that adjusts accordingly as I do this. So if you happen to have a mouse that doesn't have a scroll wheel or you're using a laptop where it's not so easy to do this, you can always use that sensitivity control to perform the same action. And so when I'm done deleting, I'll go ahead and turn off the delete tool by pressing that delete button again. So before I exit this segment, I'm just going to zoom back out to see the full segment of data just to make sure that there's no other edits that need to be performed at this time. And so to do that, I'm going to open up that zoom palette from the graph palette again. And this time I'm going to choose the one in the lower left hand corner, which is a zoom all. So now we've returned to the same amount of data that we were originally looking at. And we can see that all the R peaks that are identified on this screen have a blue peak, meaning that we're done editing and we can now exit the editor. I'm going to do that by pressing OK. And we can see now that our analysis screen is updated with the edits that we've made and our RSA value is now correct for this segment. So that is an example of how you would delete a point. Now I'm going to proceed to the next segment and we'll look at another example. So here we see another area of noise with some yellow markers and so we're going to do just as before. We're going to open our ECG editor by pressing the green edit ours button and take a look. Using the same technique I'm going to select the horizontal zoom and I'm going to zoom into this segment of data. Okay, so here we see that once again there's a high amplitude noise spike that's being falsely identified as an R peak up here. But we also see something right before it that looks quite like an R peak spike. It's around the right amplitude, it's around the right spacing, so I'm willing to bet that that's an R peak. So the first thing we want to do is delete the noise and then we'll try inserting an R peak there and see if the timing works out. So I'm going to 
select my delete tool again, hover over this point, and click my left mouse button to delete it. Now, I'm going to select my insert tool, which automatically deselects my delete tool, and I'm going to place the circle over what I suspect to be the R peak. And with that R peak in the circle, I'm going to left click once again, and the application is going to insert a peak on the, on the peak that falls within that circle. And we can see that the blue dot has appeared, meaning that the peak meets the timing criteria in the artifact detection algorithm, and the series is now clean. There are a couple other ways you can insert a peak. And, well, there's really only one other way you can insert a peak, and that is by turning snap to peak off to insert a peak specifically where you click as opposed to within the circle. So by doing that, my circle now becomes a crosshair. And wherever you click on this graph, regardless of whether it's on the signal or not, it's going to insert a peak. Now you might wonder why you'd want to do that. Well, there are some situations in which there is so much noise around what you suspect to be an R peak that you can't get your circle small enough to only capture that one peak. But you know it's there. So you can take that crosshair tool and you can just click exactly where you see the R peak and it will place a peak there. But generally, if you can see the R peak, you should try to use the snap to peak because the application is going to pick the best peak for, for that R peak. Okay, so with that, I'm going to once again zoom out, take a look at the whole graph, and we can see that our series is clean, so I'm going to press OK, and we're done editing that segment. Moving on to segment three, we can see that there's this large section of noise in the beginning of the segment, and we're going to have to deal with that, and it may be very difficult to actually find our peaks in that section, but we don't know until we open the editor, so I'm going to do that and take a look. And like before, I'm going to zoom in to the area of interest so that we can tell what's going on. And here there is a lot of movement noise. And there are some R peaks that we can identify, but there are a lot that we can't. There's a, there's a whole section in here in which you really can't tell which of these peaks are R peaks. And with heart rate variability, we can't just remove the middle of this and keep the R peaks that we see at the beginning because we need to have this 30 seconds of contiguous data to calculate RSA. So the only option for us here is to just remove this portion of data from analysis because it's okay to do that in heart rate variability as long as you have at least 30 seconds of continuous data within your segment. Obviously, you want to keep as much data as possible, but we can afford to lose these first four seconds because editing them is impossible. So there are a couple ways you can do this. And the first way I'm going to show you is by deleting all the points between the X cursors. So the X cursors are these blue vertical lines that you see on the plot at 3,061 seconds and 3,062 seconds. I want to drag these now using my mouse, and I'm first going to switch back to the crosshair tool using the graph palette at the lower left-hand corner. And I'm going to grab this cursor, and while holding down the mouse button, I'm going to move it so that it's outside of the area of noise that we want to remove points from. And I'm going to do the same thing with this other cursor. You'll notice that above it, in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, that these values change as I move these cursors. So we can see sort of where we're moving them and the distance between them. But for this particular example, all we really need to know is that the cursors are on either side of this noisy area. And then by pressing the delete all points between X cursors button at the top of the screen here, all of those points will be removed. And you'll see there's no more yellow dots. If we were to zoom out, we can see that the series has now been cleaned. We, we're able to ignore this data because we only need 30 seconds worth of continuous data for RSA.
you would do the same thing for impedance because those R peak cycles that we saw, or the lack thereof, are not quality R peak cycles, and they would therefore corrupt your ensemble if you leave all if you left all those points in there. So that's one way to remove peaks from a section of noise like that. There's another way by using the remove data portion button. So I'm going to once again zoom into that area of interest, and I'm going to press the purple reset button. Now what this will do is reset your series to however it was when you entered the editor during this session. So if you make some edits and exit, those edits are saved. But if you press this button before you, before you exit, then all of your edits will be reversed and you'll be back with your raw signal. Press reset, and now you'll see it zoom this back out and all of our yellow peaks are back. So I'm once again going to zoom in and taking my cursor tool, I'm going to move my cursors, our blue vertical lines, to either side of this noise. And instead of pressing the delete all points between X cursors button, I'm going to press the remove data portion button. This is going to literally remove the data and make it a flat line. So it achieves the same result, but now you can no longer see the data that resulted in all those yellow dots. So I actually prefer using the delete all points between X cursors button because you can always come back to this segment later and, and see where you had come from. You can see why there are no points here. Oh, because it was all noise. Whereas here, you're left to question, why did you delete that data? So Generally, when doing this action, I would recommend using the delete all points between X cursors button so that you have that information moving forward. But I'm going to go ahead and press OK now. And we can see that our yellow dots are in fact removed and this segment is clean. I'm going to move on to segment four. So you have a little more of an interesting example to it. Uh, here we can see that there is more noise in the middle of the segment. We see some noisy sections of EKG where the noise band is starting to reach up to the R peak detection threshold. So you're having these R peaks detected that are much lower in amplitude, but they still meet the characteristics of an R peak. And there is a way for us to deal with that in our editor by using the orange or the green cursors instead of the blue cursors. So these are known as the Y cursors, and you can see them horizontally across your screen, and you can drag them by clicking on them and moving them much in the same way as we did in our last example. And so what you want to do here is move the horizontal cursor up to where you're removing most of this low amplitude noise and keeping as many good R peaks as possible to minimize the number you have to reinsert. And again, you can see in the upper right hand corner that those values adjust as I move this. Once I have them in position, I can press the delete all points between Y cursors button. And same as before, it's going to delete all those points. And now that I've done that, I've reduced the number of points that I'm dealing with and I can more easily go through and deal with the additional points that are left on a case by case basis. So I'm going to start from left to right and sort of move through this. And I'm going to do that by, once again, selecting my zoom tool, selecting the area that I'm interested in, and zooming in. This first example happens to bring us to another one of our editing scenarios, which is where there should be an R peak in between these two yellow dots, but there's not one. We can't visibly see one there. And so, we can't, without, without doubt, place an R-peak in that area. So we have to deal with this in two different ways, depending on whether we're editing for HRV or for impedance. If we're editing for impedance, we're done. There's no R-peak there. There's no R-peak that we need to mark. The R-peaks on either side of it are good, so we're finished. With HRV, we need that contiguous segment of, of R-peaks, that contiguous series. And so we need to perform something called a mid-beat which is where we're going to place a beat at the mathematical center between two known good R peaks. 
in this, in this case, those two known good R peaks being the ones that are marked with a yellow star. And we're going to do this by using the X cursors once again, those blue vertical cursors. And we're going to drag them so that they're on either side of the R peaks. And there are two ways that you can insert a mid-beat. There's mid-beat auto peak and mid-beat auto peak off. And that control is located up here next to the snap to peak control. When it's on, the application is going to try to find a peak within that area that is most likely to be the R peak. But by looking at this, there is no peak like that. There is no peak that could be an R peak based on the spacing of everything. So we actually want to turn that off. And when we do that, and we press that blue mid beat button, it's going to place a point at the mathematical center between those two R peaks, regardless of what's going on with the signal at that point in time. In this case, it's not even on the signal. And, but that doesn't matter because we don't care about the amplitude of our R peaks when we're calculating RSA. We care about the timing. And by inserting a mid beat here, we're preserving the timing of the R peak series. Now we're not introducing any variability. We're sort of losing information here because we're guessing, assuming that there's no variability between these beats. But it's okay to do this a little bit. As a rule, it's okay to do this for about 10% of the total beats in your segment. So it's a good idea when you're doing this to be very aware of how many times you're doing it. Keep notes. If you find yourself doing this a lot, make sure that you realize or make sure you understand that you're not exceeding that bound of 10% of the total peaks or else you're making up too much data and your results may not be valid. So moving through here, we can go ahead and insert some R peaks, delete others that are most likely not R peaks, and so on and so forth, and go through that segment and sort of identify what might be an R peak, what might not be, and handle them in all of the cases that we've discussed so far. So I'm going to stop editing that segment there in order for us to get to a couple other examples before we run out of time. So those are all the examples that I have in this file. So I'm going to press done. And I'm going to be prompted to save my edit data. So you've made all these edits, but you haven't actually saved them to a file yet. In the MindWare applications, we store our edits in a separate file so that we never alter in any way the raw data. You can always get back to your raw data. And so when we press done, that's when we're prompted to actually save all the edits that we've done during, during the session. I'm going to go ahead and save it as example1.edh. And from this moment forward, if you want to use your edits and recall them, you always have to go to the additional settings tab and select that edit file in the edit settings section. It's already been selected for me because I've already opened that file today. But if I were to close the file and then come back to it, this field would be empty and we'd have to go through and select that edit file in order to view the data with the edits that we performed. So I do want to touch on one more topic, and that is arrhythmias, because they do occur. And to do that, I'm going to have to pull up my example two file. And go ahead and press analyze. And here we can see that there are some yellow dots and we need to go in there. Actually, I'm going to go to segment two. And we can see here some, some odd looking EKG with some yellow dots, meaning that we need to look at it a little closer. So I'm going to go ahead and open my edit ours window. And once again, I'm going to zoom in to the area of interest using my zoom tool. Okay, so here we can see something that definitely looks like an R peak. Um, it is around the same amplitude. It has some of the same characteristics, but it's much closer to the previous R peak than it is to the following R peak. And that's because this is an arrhythmia. It's a cardiac condition that we don't necessarily want to affect our statistics. You know, we're interested in, in looking at the influence of the autonomic nervous system here. We're not looking at the influence of, of cardiac conditions, which can skew your RSA, which can 
corrupt your ensemble and impedance. And so we generally want to delete these when we see them. Here we can see that the QRS complex is a little wider than normal. It's missing its P wave, sort of common characteristics of an arrhythmic beat. I'm going to take my delete tool and I'm going to delete that point. If we were impedance, we would be done because we don't want to mark any R peaks that aren't definitely on a good cycle of ECG. So we'd be finished. Since we're in HRV, we need to maintain that timing structure. We need to maintain that contiguous R peak series. And so even though we can see an R peak, because it is an arrhythmia, we need to place a mid beat here at the mathematical center between those two R peaks on either side. So much like before, I'm going to take my blue cursors and place them on either side of these beats marked with the yellow stars, and I'm going to press the mid beat button. And so now that's removing that arrhythmia from, from adding variability to our segment and sort of maintaining the existing timing structure of the data. And with that, I'll press OK. And we can see our RSA value changed. Now, I forgot to go ahead and handle the next case. So I'm going to go back into my editor, zoom in once again. And much like before, we see that this beat isn't is an arrhythmia. And I'm going to press the maybe button again, putting another mid beat in there. And now we can see that our RSA has dropped. The variability for this segment is lower because we're taking out the, the cardiac condition that was influencing that variability and we're only looking at the variability from the autonomic nervous system. So that sort of concludes all the examples that we have today. I wanted to go over a few sort of tips and tricks related to, to using the editor before we go into the Q&A section. And my first is, is really that if you can, you want to minimize the amount of time you spend in the ECG editor. So it's great that we have all these tools. It's great that you can do things relatively quickly, but no matter what, editing is still going to be the most time consuming process during analysis. And so if you can find any way to minimize the amount of editing you need to do, you're going to get more analysis done, you're going to get more data collected, and so on. So you really want to prioritize collecting good data at first, because the better your data is, the better the peak detector is going to be at finding the peaks, the less you need to edit. So make sure you practice electrode placement, make sure you're very comfortable doing it. And don't forget that if your data is a little noisy, we do have some filters in the application that could help remove some of that. So on the R peak and artifact settings tab, we have the baseline and muscle noise filter, which deals with some motion artifact, and the notch filter, which can remove the electrical interference caused by 60 hertz electrical devices, or 50 hertz if you're in other parts of the world. We also have some settings related to R peak detection that you can tweak to, to, to make some adjustments to how we're finding R peaks that can really help with certain data sets. I'm not going to go into any examples of that today, but there are some support articles on our support site that talk a little bit about how you can use those tools to find more R peaks and reduce the amount of editing that you need to do. And while we're speaking about filtering, another important concept to think about is the edit file and how those edits are stored. So the edit file is actually going to be storing the amplitude and position of each R peak that you've identified in a segment. Now when you filter your data, you're changing your data. You know? You're know, you changing maybe the timing of it a little bit. You're changing the amplitude of it a little bit. It's OK to do that if you're removing noise that would otherwise make the data unusable. But if you've already made your edits, you can no longer change those filters. Because as soon as you add a filter, the amplitude of your data might change slightly, the timing might change slightly, and those edited data points are no longer going to line up with the R peaks in the application. So if you ever open an edit file and you look at the data and the peaks appear to be floating above the actual signal, you probably have a filter setting different from when you edited it. So you can come back out, 
change your filters and hopefully find the correct combination that, that you used when you were performing your edits. You can also reuse your edits. So we've talked a lot about the differences between editing in HRV and editing in impedance. But we're still editing ECG in both places. And it's quite possible that you're able to edit your data in such a way that it makes sense to use in both HRV and impedance. So you can open an impedance edit file in HRV and vice versa. But if you do need to perform any edits that would no longer make a segment valid in impedance or, or vice versa, then you need to be aware of that and you need to not reuse those edits when when those conditions are met. And finally, you can also reuse edits across different event modes. So last month we did a webinar on events and modes, and there are many different ways you can look at your data, and it's okay to edit in one mode, switch to another, and apply those edits. But just make sure that you look at the segments of data before simply writing them out to Excel because the edits that made sense in one mode might make sense in the other mode, but then again, they might not. They might create some gap in data for HRV, for example, that would no longer be valid to calculate RSA. So those are some things to be aware of. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and move to the question and answer portion of the webinar. So I'll take a moment to look over some of the questions that have come in. And if you do decide to exit the webinar before we finish today, please do complete the exit survey because we do take your feedback into account when we're planning and writing future webinars. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the question and answer questions and I'll be back in a moment. Okay, so we have a request to show an example of editing in the impedance application. So I'm going to close the HRV application and launch the impedance application. Okay, so I've got one of my files open in impedance. I'm going to press analyze. And I'm going to go to segment two. So here's the example that we had just looked at where we were dealing with some, some arrhythmia. And I'm going to open the editor. So we can see, I was talking a lot about the ensemble graph, and we can see that down below here in the ensemble average. Basically, that's just an average representation of an ECG and DCDT cycle across this segment. I'm going to open the editor in the same way, and you can see that the editor looks the same, has all the same buttons, the same features. It is the same editor. And I'm going to zoom in on that flagged beat. Here, the only difference is that instead of deleting and performing a mid-beat, I'm just going to delete it. And we can see here as well that this beat that was previously flagged does not really have a corresponding DZDT waveform after it, like all the other ones do, DZDT being in blue. I'll make it another color so it's a little easier to see. So in impedance, we're looking for quality cycles of ECG followed by DZDT. In this case, it's not really followed by DZDT. It's lacking. So we don't want to insert a peak here we want to leave it as it is. And if we go later to this next area where there are yellow peaks, we can see that once again, there's no DZDT cycle following this arrhythmic beat. So we don't want to insert anything here. We just want to leave it. And before I leave this segment, I happen to notice earlier that there was some noise in our DZDT signal. This is a little different in impedance as well, where we have good R peaks here. There's no question about it. But in looking at the DZDT waveform behind it, it's not so good. There's a lot of noise. And all R peaks that we have flagged are going to go into the ensemble, meaning that all, all of the DZDT cycles immediately following those will also be used in finding that ensemble average. So by including this R peak, even though it's good, we're introducing this noise into our DZDT ensemble, which is not necessarily good. So for this segment, it would be perfectly okay to actually delete that point and delete this one because there's no DZDT cycle after it that looks like a quality DZDT cycle like you'd see in these last two peaks. 
Now, the ensemble average is pretty good at removing noise like this, so the difference is going to be pretty minor for this particular segment in doing this, but in, in segments of data where there's a lot more noise in DZDT, the effect can be pretty significant. So another thing to look at when you're editing an impedance is what's going on with the DZDT waveform following each one of these R peaks and does it make sense to include it in my ensemble. And in this case, even though there are yellow peaks there, it's okay. Okay, there's a question. Um, why are the ECG amplitudes fluctuating? So just due to the nature of the data collection, the, the peaks may fluctuate a little bit. It's not necessarily a problem as long as you see the correct morphology, you know, the QRS complex, maybe the T wave. We have some resources available on our support site once again to help deal with this. But they tend to fluctuate with respiration mainly because your, your chest is moving in and out, but it's not really an issue and it's not anything to be concerned about. Okay, we have a question about the 10% rule. So the 10% rule doesn't apply to impedance because we're never guessing at beats and impedance, we're only removing bad ones. So you can perform a lot of edits in impedance without concern. But in HRV, we have this concern of artificially inserting or guessing at more than 10% of our total beats. So we don't have a mechanism built into the application to keep track of that for you, but there's a pretty easy way to do it. So I'm going to first launch the HRV application again and open up that last file that we were analyzing. and go to the second segment. So we have this statistic on the right-hand side of the analysis screen called number of R peaks. So that's the total number of R peaks in a given segment. And as we're doing our edits, if we keep track of the number of peaks that we're artificially creating, that we're inserting via mid-beat, then we'll know how many, you know, how many of those we performed. And in the Excel output file, we're going to have this number of R peaks, which is the total number of R peaks in your segment. So with a very simple calculation, we can determine the percentage of total R peaks that we had inserted without really seeing a peak or a beat. And using that, we can determine whether we've exceeded that 10% threshold. And really, if you could say, under 10%, under 10 that's really preferable, but you just need to be able to justify that in your papers, your publications, so it's best to stay under that if possible. So there's a question about where the mid-beat tool is inserting a point relative to the signal. So when we're looking at the R-Peak series, we don't care at all about the amplitude. I mean, we do in terms of visually Amplitudes shouldn't change that drastically between R peaks, so we can use it as a visual cue as to whether or not something is an R peak. But beyond that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't go into the calculation of RSA. Really, we're just looking at the timing between those peaks. And so the mid-beat can place that peak at any amplitude, and it doesn't really matter as long as it's placing it at the mathematical center. So I'm going to open the ECG editor once again, and I'm going to zoom in to this mid-beat example. And when I delete this peak, and I move my cursors to be on either side of my known good R peaks, I'm going to turn off my mid-beat auto peak because I don't want it to select this peak. We've just decided that it's not a valid R peak that we want to analyze on, and press mid-beat. It's going to place it at some amplitude, but between those two points at the mathematical center. This amplitude is inconsequential, does not affect any of your statistics, but it does now re restore the timing characteristics of the R-Peak series, and it won't affect your RSA negatively. So no worries about that. It does not need to be in the signal. It just needs to be in the center, and the mid-beat tool takes care of all that for you. We have another question about the blue dots versus the yellow stars. 
So I mentioned at the beginning and a few times throughout the webinar that we have this artifact detection step. And so we have two algorithms that we use to detect artifact. And their parameters are located on the RPEAK and artifact settings tab. And they're called the IBI MinMax and the MADMED. So the IBI MinMax is, is very simple. It just looks for any heart rate change that goes above or below thresholds that you define. And they're set to 40 and 200 by default because those are typical human heart rates unless you're engaging in high energy activity or if you're a really little baby. MADMED looks at the variability between peaks and decides whether it's likely that a change in variability could have occurred that rapidly. And if, if we think that a, a peak that the peak detector found doesn't meet either of those criteria, it's going to be marked as yellow. If it passes both of these checks, it's going to be marked as blue. So when you're looking at a segment, you want to look closer at the areas that have yellow stars to identify, you know, is there really artifact here? If so, how am I going to handle it? That doesn't mean that you shouldn't look carefully at the rest of your data, um, especially in the case of the impedance application, because there might be other reasons to delete some of those points, like a bad DCDT signal. But in general, blue dots mean that it meets the proper timing and it's not to be, you know, a concern of yours. Okay, so we, we have another question about the 10% the rule, and I'm just going to go ahead and touch on that again really quick. So when we do mid-beating, we're guessing at where a beat might have been. When we have these arrhythmias, we're, we're placing it where it should have been. And when we can't see the R peak, we're guessing at where it might have been, but still basing it on mathematically the center point between two peaks that we know are good. But in doing so, we're, we're, we're removing some variability from the overall segment. And so we're going to ultimately affect our RSA. Now we're minimizing the impact of RSA. If we hadn't done anything, if we don't mid-beat at all, then our RSA is definitely going to be incorrect for the segment. If we guess by placing it at the mathematical center, we're still not getting a perfect RSA measure, but it's much, much better and it's usable compared to it not being usable. Uh, but the more we do this, the more we end up influencing RSA. And we want to keep that influence to a minimum. So typically, we don't want to artificially insert more than 10% of our R peaks for a given segment. And so the best way to do this, because there's not a mechanism built into the application to keep track of it, is as you're editing a segment, if you find yourself doing a lot of mid-beats, start keeping track of how many of them you've inserted. And, and just keep that note with this subject. And then when you write out to Excel, this number of R peaks field is also going to be there. And if you know the number of R peaks, and you know the, the number of R peaks that you inserted via mid-beat, then you can pretty easily determine what percentage of beats that is, and determine whether you exceeded that 10% rule or whether you're within it. And, and that'll be important for determining whether a segment of data is, is usable or not, because if you exceed that, well, then you have to, you have to convince your, your reviewers that that's acceptable, and that's not so easy to do. All right, so we don't currently have any more questions in the queue, but we still have five more minutes left of the presentation, so I'm going to stay on the line, and uh, if you have any questions, please do continue to send them in, and we will deal with them. If you do decide to leave the webinar at this time, please do be sure to fill out the, the feedback survey because we do appreciate that. And also, be sure to check out our support.mindwaretech.com site because we have some resources on there that can reinforce some of the topics we discussed today as well as a whole plethora of additional information. So we'll be on the line awaiting additional questions. Okay, so we have a question regarding DZDT in the impedance application and respiration in the HRV application. And so in, in the impedance application, our DZDT ends up 
in the ensemble average because we're using the timing between aspects of the ECG signal and aspects of the DZDT signal to derive some statistics. In HRV, we're not doing this ensemble. We're looking at frequency analysis of the R-peak series, but we also have this respiratory component here that we look at to confirm that our RSA is correct. And you can sort of deal with it actually in the same way as we dealt with the DZDT in that if you see a lot of noise in your respiratory signal, you could try to edit some of that out using the remove data portion feature in the editor. But it becomes tricky because in impedance, you could just delete the R peak and that would then discard the subsequent DZDT cycle from the ensemble and, and you're good to go. In HRV, we can't delete an R peak because we need, to we need to maintain that, that timing series, that contiguous time series. So the best you can get away with is removing portions of respiration between R peaks that are noise that may be affecting your respiratory frequency content. Um, there's not an example of that in this file and it would actually be very difficult to do. But if your respiratory signal, say, got very noisy near the end of your data and it was affecting your respiratory power spectrum, you could just delete all that data and you'd still have your 30 seconds of continuous data in the first part of your segment, but with good respiration data with which to compare. So that's one way in which you can, you can use respiration to help influence some of your edits, but typically you're not gonna do that. It's a lot more frequent in impedance that you pay attention to that DZDT waveform. Okay, and we've got another question then about when should you just give up and delete a whole section of points versus trying to salvage it by using the midbeat tool and guessing where those points go? So a real easy way to, to determine that is if you make up that many points, if you guess that many points, does that put you over your 10% limit right there? Because if so, then you should not do it. Now, if you're below the 10% range and and you want to try to salvage some data, then you basically just have to go through and very carefully and probably at a very high zoom level, look at all that data and try to determine where the R peaks are. Um, another sort of reason that you would not want to try to salvage, or if it, another reason that you'd want to salvage data is if your noise occurs in the middle of your segment. If the noise occurs in the middle of your segment, that means you have no choice but to salvage it because you may not have 30 seconds of continuous data on either side of it. So this, for example, I can't just, on this segment, I can't just come in here and delete this because I don't want to try to find the R peaks there because now we no longer have continuous data across the entire segment. I could come in here and remove this last portion. So instead of just dealing with that one small section of noise, I could just bound this last, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds of data with my cursors and delete it. But we're losing a lot of information there that's completely salvageable. So it really comes down to how difficult and how possible is it for you to dig down into the noise and find R peaks. And it's gonna take more time and uh, the results may be marginal, they might not change that much, but it's always a good idea to, to try to save your data until you realize that you absolutely can't, and then you can just go ahead and delete them all. And as a point of clarification, the 10% rule does not apply to deleting R peaks or data portions. It's only when you're artificially inserting data. So you, if the peak detector fails to detect over 10% of your peaks and you have to insert them manually, that's perfectly fine because you're just fixing the mistakes of the peak detector. But there's data there that you can see visually and you know that there's R peaks here that you just have to identify because the application wasn't able to do it for you. Same with deleting points. If the application finds a whole lot of R peaks and you have to delete them all, as long as the R peaks that you're left with are valid R peaks, then they don't even count towards that 10% total. As soon as you start saying, okay, well, I can't see an R peak here, but there should be one, so I'm gonna guess, 
or okay, here's an arrhythmia. I don't want it to influence my RSA, so I'm going to split the difference. Then you're starting to contribute to that 10%, and you're starting to artificially influence your RSA measure. And in impedance, you just don't want to get too carried away with yourself. So we want to, within a given segment, capture as many R peaks as possible so that we have a good representation of the, the average QRS cycle within a certain time period, the time period that you're interested in. So the 10% rule doesn't exactly apply in impedance because none of the points that we're, we're not ever guessing at where an R peak is. We're always saying definitively that an R peak is a certain place. So that doesn't apply there, but you still want to try your best to identify all valid R peaks in a given segment just so that you have a best representation of that time period in your statistics. Okay, so with that, we are out of time, but I'd like to say thank you very much for attending the webinar today, and be sure to stay tuned on our support site. We do list the upcoming webinars there on our training page, so thank you again, and have a great day.